Hey there, welcome back to our channel. If you tuned into our previous video, you'll recall that we talked about a simplified package for WebDPU and demonstrated how it can streamline the process of creating WebDPU applications. Today, we're going to take it a step further and dive into creating a 3D sphere object using this package. The primary focus of this example is to showcase how to effectively update the GPU buffers when there are changes to the vertex data. This skill is crucial for maintaining dynamic and interactive visuals in your web GPU applications. By the end of this video, you'll have a solid understanding of how to leverage this powerful package to create impressive 3D objects and efficiently handle updates to the GPU buffers. So, let's dive right in and get started. In this example, we'll specifically modify the vertex data in real time, allowing us to adjust parameters such as sphere's radius and the numbers of UV segments. To achieve this, we need to update the GPU buffers that store the vertex data. Now, let's get started with the project we worked on in our last video. If you already have the project on your local machine, simply open it using Visual Studio Code. If not, don't worry, you can easily download the project from our GitHub repository using the command git clone followed by the branch name and the repository URL link. This will download the project onto your local machine. Simply open this project using Visual Studio Code. and then use the command npm install to install all npm packages required by this example. In this example, we will employ the commonly used longitude and latitude approach to create a sphere with wireframe. This method also known as the UV sphere. The UV sphere method involves dividing the sphere into segments and V rings as illustrated here. U segments and V rings form grids on the sphere surface. To create a 3D sphere, we can focus on just one unit grid, as shown here. This grid represents a small section of the overall sphere and allows us to easily generate the vertices and triangles needed for the wireframe representation. Now, let's open the vertex data.ts file from the common folder. Inside the file, we'll add a function called getSpherePosition. This function will define a 3D point on the sphere in the spherical coordinate system. Here is the angle theta, and here is the angle phi. Here are x, y, and z coordinates. Next, let's add another function named getSphereData. This function takes radius and UV segments as input arguments. Inside this function, we'll start by using the previously implemented getSpherePosition function to calculate the positions, normals, and UVs for all grid points on the sphere's surface. Additionally, we'll define two arrays, indices and indices2, which will be employed to generate the sphere surface and wireframe, respectively. Within the for loop, we only need to consider a single unit grid with four grid points, index 0, index 1, index 2, and index 3. For each unit grid, we'll add six index numbers for two triangles to the indices array, and four index numbers for two line segments to the indices 2 array. This means that we only need to draw two line segments for each unit grid as the remaining two line segments will be drawn by the other unit grids. This strategy ensures that we avoid drawing the same line segment multiple times. By iterating through all grids, we can construct the wireframe for the entire sphere surface. Then, let's add a new shader file called onlet.wdsl to the section 01 folder and paste the code to this file. This shader includes two uniform buffers and one for passing the model view projection matrix and the other for passing the color. This shader will be used to generate both the shear surface and wireframe. 
Next, add a new TypeScript file called sphere.ts to the section 01 folder and paste the code to this file. If you watched the last video, you should be familiar with the code structure. The first part is the create pipeline function. It handles the creation of the render pipeline, generation of key PU buffers, and construction of binding groups. The second part of the code is the draw function. It defines the render pass, assigns pipelines, vertex buffers, and uniform binding groups to the render pass, and submits execution commands to the GPU. The final part is the run function, which serves as our main function controlling the execution flow. In the run function, we first perform initialization tasks for WebDP by defining the canvas, adapter, device, and context. Next, we generate vertex data and create the render pipeline by calling the get sphere data and create pipeline functions, respectively. Then, we define 3D transformation matrices and camera. Inside the frame subfunction, we animate the sphere rotation using the request animation frame function for each frame. The code has been explained in great details in my previous video series, and we won't discuss it further here. One important change we have made in this example is that when the input parameters such as the sphere's radius and the number of UV segments are modified, we need to regenerate the vertex data for the sphere. This regeneration process is described in this code block. Since the vertex data has changed, we must update the GPU buffers with the new vertex data. This is achieved using the update vertex buffers function implemented in our web GPU simplified package. You can examine in the source code for this function at our GitHub repository. The update vertex buffers function takes several input arguments, including the GPU device, I pipeline, data, and original number of vertices. The data argument represents the updated new data resulting from changes made by the users to the parameters. Similarly, the argument of the original number of vertices indicates the number of vertices in the original data before any parameter modifications. If modifying the parameters only affects the data values and not the buffer size, we can simply write the updated data directly into the existing buffers using the device crew write buffer function. However, if modifying the parameters affects the buffer size, we need to follow a slightly different process. We must first destroy the original buffers and then recreate new buffers with the updated size, and finally, write the new data to the newly created buffers. To determine whether the buffer size has changed, we compare the length of the original data with that of the new data. Here, we use the equal to comparison, but we could also use less than or equal to. This comparison ensures that as long as the new buffer size is less than or equal to the original buffer size, we can write the new data directly to the original buffers without the need to destroy them. Now, let's proceed to add this example to the navigation menu. Open the side nav.html file from the Asir C HTML folder and add the following link sphere with wireframe. Once we have done, we can proceed to build and compile the code by executing the command in pm run prod in the terminal window. Then clicking on the go live to open the default web browser and view our sphere in action. This example allows for the manipulation of several input parameters, such as the plot type, UV segments, and radius. Additionally, you can interact with the sphere directly through the use of the mouse. When changing the URV segments, You'll notice smooth transitions as the grids on the sphere adapt accordingly. As a test, if we mistakenly set the original number of vertices to the new data, resulting in an attempt to write the new data to the original GPU buffers, an error will occur. 
This error will indicate that the buffer size does not match, leading to the sphere not appearing on the screen. Therefore, it's important to ensure that the original data is set back as intended. Now we obtain a smooth sphere when parameters are changed. Now let's conclude today's video. In the next installment, we will discuss the light models in WebGPU. Make sure to stay tuned for that upcoming video. Thank you so much for watching today's video. I hope you found it informative and helpful for your WebGPU development journey. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more exciting content. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them down below. Until next time, happy coding.